And so then they said, uh, we could treat it probably with radiation and chemotherapy, but if it doesn't work, your nose and your skin will be compromised and we can't do what we really need to do, which is amputate your nose. And I said, amputate my nose, that's barbaric. You can't be serious. As it turns out, the doctors were serious. We'll get into that a little later, along with the miraculous medical procedure that provided my guest with a brand new nose. If the name Richard Courtney sounds familiar, maybe you've seen it on yard signs all over Nashville. He's one of the city's top real estate agents. But he's also a father to twins, a writer, a rock music scholar, and quite possibly Music City's biggest Beatles fanatic. Yes, that's a big claim, but we've got receipts. I'm Demetria Kalodimos. It's Banner and Company. starting from the beginning. Okay. I know you're from Columbia, Tennessee. That's right. Any connection to mules? Well, uh, when I was in Columbia, it's interesting, Mule Day had ceased. And uh, my mother had been in the Mule Day court back in the 40s. But, but I, I moved there in 55 and pretty much left in 73 when I went to college. And there was no Mule Day at that time. And I guess they brought it back a year or two later. And now it's a big deal. And I know you went to Columbia Military Academy. Right. Uh, Tell me about that institution. Was that punishment or oh, no. by choice? Well, for me, it was by choice. It was founded in 1905, and it was an honor school by the uh, United States government. It was given to it was an uh, armory, and and the prior it was built to be an armory, and then uh, and then it turned into military school in 05. and um, I went there mainly because uh, I wasn't going to be able to perform on a scale athletically as well as the public school because there's only one in, at that time in Columbia and so I was like the 12th man on the basketball team but if I went to CMA I could be like the fourth so uh, I liked that and so I went over there and it was an interesting time because it was I was there from 68 to 73 so the height of the Vietnam War and Kent State and all of that so at first when I was there, we wore our military uniforms, Army issued, to play away games. And I played football, basketball, and baseball. And we'd come and there'd be the people who were screaming warmonger, baby killer, and all that, and throw tomatoes and celery sticks were the worst. I, ne I didn't know they threw those things, but they did. And apples and things. So then they made it where we could wear gray slacks and a blue blazer, and it, and it wasn't as bad. But it was tough to be in a military school at that time, which is why it closed do you think that generationally now, like young men have no clue what was hovering above oh, no, it was their terrifying. dads and uncles and so forth? It was terrifying. And people my age, I mean, uh, you know, the song where it says, be the first one on your block to have your son come home in a box. That happened quite a bit. And um, in a small community like Columbia, uh, it seemed like once a month or every two or three months we'd we'd go to a funeral with the with a flag draped over the coffin of somebody who's under 25 it's only a new well you know as a friend uh so it wasn't like world war ii where i knew my parents friends had died or or become maimed or injured it was people my age uh who were dying over there well here's the worst part of well, like at columbia military academy we had to have three active uh, United States Army officer, two officer, one officer and two enlisted men, enlisted on you know, site, on site teaching us military science. So they were fresh off, they were fresh home from there to the, the NC and the non commissioned officers, the sergeants, and they would tell us the truth, you know, the, nothing you could see. And it, it's horrifying. Now we know more with Platoon and, and uh, all the other movies that have come out yeah. in the last 20 years or so, but. Uh, what the uh, what they were enduring there is, I don't see how any of them are okay now. Do you think your instructors had PTSD? Oh, I know they did. I mean, they were they the, well, they couldn't stop talking about it, and they would uh, they would become emotional. And like in the uh, first aid classes, the films, as you might imagine, were antiquated, and and they were uh, they they had like fake intestines, but they were showing us how to treat wounds, basically. Military wounds, not uh, like Boy Scouts, where you yeah. trip on a 
log or something, you know, where somebody shot you or blew or you landed on a grenade or whatever. And uh, he'd start, they would uh, start telling us um, tr tr stories they'd seen seven or eight months ago and what it did to the, to the bodies of, his, of their friends. It's terrifying. I'm a little bit younger than you, but I remember wearing my silver oh, yeah. POW bracelet. Right. And everyone did. Yeah. Would you have joined the service? I mean, you could have been drafted, correct? Oh, yeah. I had an, the draft at the time. There was a lottery, and they j chose numbers. Birthdays had numbers. And up to about number 129, usually had to go. And the, and the college deferment was gone at the time. And so I was number 43, which is, I was gone. And the worst part for me is I had four years of what they call junior ROTC from CMA. So I would have gone in as an E6 or a corporal, uh, which, is, which is bad because that would be like a squad leader. So I would be the one where the, the lieutenant said, you take your squad and go charge that hill. And so that was terrifying. And then the war ended. So from there to Sewanee? Yes. Why Sewanee? That's another funny story. So Sewanee recruited in the area, in Columbia, and they came by, and the uh, person that, the representative, wanted, really wanted me to come there. So he, he, he recruited me relatively hard. My father and my, my aunt and uncle and my grandfather said, they all gone to Vanderbilt. And I was a Vanderbilt sports fan, still am, sadly. And uh, so... Uh, I thought I'd go to Vanderbilt, and then at the la and then playing basketball, we went to a tournament we weren't supposed to fare very well in, and my SAT test was on the Saturday. I only had it twice a year down there. And so we won, and then we had to play in Jackson, Tennessee on Saturday, so I missed the SAT. So Sewanee said, if you'll come, we can, we're licensed to give the SAT, come on up. We'll give it to you, and then you, you can come to school here. So it did feel somewhat of an obligation because they were nice enough to do that. But I put Vanderbilt on there in Kentucky for some reason. It's not like now where you go to all the schools and look at everything. I didn't know what I was going to do. But I figured I would go to Vanderbilt. So I went, and Sewanee said, well, you know, you did well enough. You can come here. We want you here. And, and I waited a week or two, and I didn't hear from Vanderbilt. So I sent Sewanee $100 to reserve my spot. And then Vanderbilt accepted me. And my father said, well, don't you want to go to Vanderbilt? And I said, I'm not going to waste 100 bucks." You know, so I went to Sewanee because <laughs> I didn't want to waste $100 on Vanderbilt. Now, it, it had to have been newly um, co-ed. Yes. My freshman year, the, the May before I arrived, the first women graduated. So I was five years into the women coming. And I hear that letting women in was not initially popular. Uh, I don't think it was. It, wasn't, it didn't bother me, uh, but I was glad to have them there. Only they were so darn smart. Uh, they were all, you know, they all had to score better than we did because there weren't as many of them at, her, at first. And uh, but yeah, they they had a tough time at first. The women did. And the first valedictorian, the first woman who was a valedictorian, was a year behind me. Frances Dennis was her name. What was your grand plan? Did you go in knowing exactly what you wanted to do? Well, I anticipated I would go to law school, and then uh, some other people decided I wouldn't, and uh, they're called deans. <laughs> and so <laughs> I, uh, I didn't fare that well. So I came back to Columbia Military Academy after Sewanee and taught school, 6th, 7th, and 8th grade math. Well, I was there as a director of admissions and alumni affairs, and then the math teacher quit. Now, you were talking about guys smoking weed and doing psychedelics. I mean, I'm picturing buzz cuts and, you know, good soldiers. Yeah, well, we had, uh, by the time I graduated, we could grow our, we could pretty much have a, a Beatles haircut from 1963 Beatles. We could have it down to our eyebrows, and it could touch our ears. So, but when I got there, it, it was pretty buzzy. We have to take a short break here, but when we come back, we'll hear just how significant the Beatles are to Richard Courtney. This is Banner and Company. You just heard our guest, Richard Courtney, talking about his Beatles haircut in the 60s. But funny thing, he has actual locks of the Beatles' hair in his basement which might as well be a museum. Richard took us on a tour downstairs and deep into his obsession. 
Uh, oh, we're headed down to the Beetle basement. That's the new term. And it's a Beetle's museum as we step over a few things. The Beetle basement has about 600 square feet. When I uh, had to get it appraised, the appraiser hired uh, someone from the Johnny Cash Museum to come archive it. So I have 3,800 things <laughs> here, some nicer than others. But we have a copy of the Beetle 65 somewhere in here. Where is it? Oh, holy cow. There's Herman's Herman. Oh. Who in the world is that? Ronnie, oh, Ronnie Spector. That's pretty cool. I forgot to add that. <laughs> so I, I said, well, I like the, the, the song She Loves You fairly well. So I thought I'd just collect all of them, maybe. Well, I'm up to 3,000. And so I have 42 different versions of She Loves You from different countries and different sleeves. I have all of the so, autographs of all of the people that John Lennon mentioned. I have the very last... John Lennon erotic lithograph, a photograph of them going the wrong way or the way different from the album cover. Uh, Paul McCartney autograph, Paul two of Paul McCartney's wife's autographs. This is a t-shirt of the Beatles from their last photo shoot when they were mad at one another. And these are pictures of the Beatles uh, from the TV show. I have some yellow submarines floating in there and of course an octopus in his garden. Over here are the sheets that they slept in and this is in uh, Detroit, and these two are in Kansas City. And then that's pieces of their hair from the brushes from the makeup artist of Help. The, pres the CEO uh, of Apple was here a few weeks ago, and he was wandering through the collection, and he'd say, do you have this, and do you have that? And I, no, I don't have that. You know, I have 3,800 things, but I don't have that one or that one or that one. Well, about a month later, everything I didn't have arrived from Apple. <laughs> Richard, where did you first hear the Beatles? Well, I was uh, eight when they came here, or when I, I turned nine in, in 1963, right before they arrived. And uh, I was at a friend's house uh, all the time, a certain friend, and his, he had older sisters. And, uh, and they played Elvis records, and uh, Elvis had switched to the movie Elvis that wasn't quite as exciting as the Sun Records Elvis. And, uh, and we, we really, uh, you know, parried him, and we thought he was uh, ri ridiculous um, at, that, at that point of his career. Uh, and, and then one day they put on the Beatles, and, and you know, at the, that time, a stereo was a piece of furniture in the living room. So they were in their living room listening, the three or four of the, they were probably 13 or 14 years old. And, uh, and I heard, uh, I want to hold your hand. And I thought, what in the world? So I went in there and said, what's going on here? And they handed me the album cover and said, you'd have to be a hermit not to know who the Beatles were. And I didn't know what a hermit was, and I didn't know what the Beatles were either. <laughs> so I figured I must be a hermit. And, and then I just really enjoyed it. And, I, you know, there wasn't as much information as there is now. And then they came on Ed Sullivan. I don't know how, I still, I've asked her the other day how she got that record, because she got it earlier than... Most people, and, and we were in Columbia, which would not be a hot spot for record distribution, but she had one somehow. And uh, and then on, when Ed Sullivan happened, I just was was taken by them, and still am. Who um, you know? Who's your favorite Beatle? Yeah, uh, it changes every day, and I get angry with different ones every day too. There, you know, they were just some kids, you know, with um, enormous talent, and uh, Len John Lennon was. At first, and then, uh, you know, I've really come to appreciate Paul McCartney, especially talking to the people who recorded with him when he was here. They said, you can wake up in the middle of the night, and he, perfect pitch, and he can play any instrument, and he can see the whole. He's like Ray Stevens uh, here. You know, he's a kind of, I think Ray Stevens is probably the most talented person in Nashville, and, uh, and they're a lot alike. When uh, the 2010 flood happened here, uh, Carl Dean was the mayor, and he had a joint meeting of leadership in Nashville and leadership music to reopen the city because, you know, everything had flooded down there. Paul McCartney was sort of like, we're back open for business, and because they knew the whole world would care where McCartney was. 
so Carl Dean lives across the street from me, so I've known him forever. And so he announces Paul McCartney's coming to a joint meeting of Leadership Nashville, Leadership Music. So when it was over, there was a place to go back and get a beer. So I went back there and said, by the way, when he comes, you know, you, you can meet him. He expects to have to meet the mayor. And he said, oh, and you know, Carl's real quiet. It's amazing he ever. But ran. he's a huge music fan. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he is. And he said, uh, I'm not, I'm not going to do that. I said, no, no. I, I know that every city he's ever played in for all these years, he's had to meet the mayor, kiss the mayor's children. So you can go, you can go and you need to take your buddy. And he said, I'm not going to do that. I said, all right. So the day of the show, Janelle Lacey, his communications manager, calls me and says, are you near the mayor's office? And I was actually on Granny White Pike and Old Hickory Boulevard. And I told a slight fib, and I said, I'm at the Parthenon. And she said, so you can get down here in what, like 10 minutes? I said, oh, yeah. So I started speeding down Granny White, and I thought, if they pull me over, I'll just say the mayor wants me. Take me to the mayor. And, uh, and I got there in, 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 in fairly close time, and she said, go on in. And he said, well, they've asked me to come meet Paul McCartney, and they said I could bring Ann, his wife, and he said, I have to bring Richard Courtney or, or I can't go. <laughs> and, they, and Steve Moore, and so yeah. he said, well, sure, if you want, if you want to. And so we, we met Paul McCartney and talked for about 30 minutes. When I, we were going in to meet Paul, I said, Is it, can we ask for autographs? They said, if it's going well, you can. So towards the end, I looked over at the guy, and, and I had a, you know, and he said, you can go ahead. So I he, he has a young daughter, and, and he's older than I am, but I, I said, you you and I are about the same age, knowing we weren't, and we have children about the same age. He said, oh, yeah. I said, yeah, I have two of them, and, and it would really be great if I could get an autograph for both of them. And so he did, but he showed me how to tell if the autographs are real, and it's unbelievable. Really? Yeah, and, and, and I can't. They, Are I'm you on, sworn to secrecy? I mean, I wouldn't because if we if I tell anyone, nothing. they'll know how to do it because it's not that hard. But I am in several Facebook and other pages where people say, "Is this real?" And I can tell in five if something from 2010 on is supposed to have been signed by him. I know whether or not it was. Oh, it was funny, but not funny. It's interesting because George had been attacked and. In his own home, John oh, yeah. had been shot. I remember that. Yeah. So the way it works in Bridgestone, they had three identical tents. So if you were going to kill him, you wouldn't even know which tent he was in. And then once you got in the tent, there was a, there were, it was a maze, and you'd walk for a while, and then you'd have to go left or right or that. So and then they put us in one tent, and he was actually in the other tent. But here's another thing. While I was talking to him, I said, "Are you going to go to the Opry?" Because Carl kind of let me go, you know. And uh, he said, what, what's the offer? I said, well, the Ryman Auditorium, because, you know, everyone comes to Mother Church and all this stuff. And he said, I don't know what that is. And he had recorded here for six weeks. Back in 73. Yeah, at the yeah. sound shop. And, uh, and so I said, surely someone took you to the, to the Ryman Auditorium where they have the Grand Ole Opry. He said, oh, yeah, that's right. They made me get me back and crawl under the pews and show me the snuff and the tobacco and the chewing gum. Now, who the heck took Paul McCartney and made him get on his back at the Ryman to show him that? Did Paul talk like Paul with his odd little, you yeah, know, cadence? He was, yeah, he was Paul. He was Paul McCartney for sure, no doubt about it. He, as they say with almost all the lot of famous people, he's much shorter than I anticipated. But, really? Yeah. Yeah, I don't. He doesn't strike me as short. Yeah, I thought he would be about six one because he's taller than John and George. So they must. I didn't meet them. They must really be. And I did meet Ringo. He is tiny. My very first Rip and Read radio internship, I read the John Shot Bulletin. Oh. And I kept the piece of wire copy. Oh yeah. But of course, you know that ink faded away in like a year. Oh, but I yeah. thought I'd have that piece of history. Where were you when that happened? I was in a house I owned in Bellevue at Beach Bend Drive. And, uh, you know, I saw it on, on uh, the football game, like many did. And have you ever listened to the clip off air of uh, Cosell? And uh, I think, I guess it was Rune Arledge and whoever the two guys, uh, I think Don Meredith and um, 
whoever his other sidekick were, were on the uh, – we're discussing should we say it or should we do it and then you know they're saying are, is it verified or and they said well they're announcing it other places and we can't monday night football is so popular they didn't want to break all the way away so they just let they finally decided to let howard announce it here's the here's one of the stranger things that's happened to me because of this so my wife is the president of finn partners pete pr firm and so one of her top people now is philip mcgowan you know, whose father is Charles McGowan, who started Christ Presbyterian Academy, and as it was a minister, is, I guess, still. So on December the 8th, 1980, he, they're living in Atlanta, and their phone rings, and his eight-year-old brother answers in his New York Police Department. They want to speak to the Reverend McGowan, and it's Mark Chapman. Ah. And that was his one phone call was to the person who founded CPA, which is interesting enough. And then I met him later, uh, C the CPA, and I said, uh, do you still talk to me? He said, yeah, I'm his spiritual advisor, and I'd go up there every now and then. And I said, well, ask him if he'd want to talk to me. I had the radio show there. If he want to talk to me, and maybe I want to do, I don't know what. I thought it would be interesting to meet Mark Chapman. So he talked to Chapman. Chapman said, yes, yeah. so he gave me his address and his contact info, and I put it in my database, and I send out mailers three or four times a year. And during three or four years, I would talk to people and say, I think I could have Mark Chapman on the show, and I don't know what to do with it or what to do. And people say, don't you dare, don't, don't talk to him. Don't do anything. Well, then I sent a flyer that was a Christmas card that had my children at All Saints Chapel, and I get an email from Chapman's wife, and he's still married to the same person he was married when he killed Lennon. And he said, I see you're a Christian. It looks like you're in a Catholic church. And I know Father Merton and this person and that person. And I'm, and I'd love to chat with you sometime. Here's my, here's how you do it. And you have to go through something called JPay. I don't know if you ever talked to anybody in prison, but mm -hmm. so I thought, well, all right. So I've sent him. And now that's been going on for about seven years. And we probably swap emails about three times a month. So I have a hundred or so communications with Mark Chapman, who's since come clean on what he, you know, he said at the first, the devil made him do it, and he, and he heard voices, and he did a, a satanic, satanic ritual. He's thrown all that away, so he just wanted to be famous. Mm. Yeah. But he's, um, you know, he's been there 43 years, and I think he's reformed. But he'll never get out. Because Yoko goes to his parole hearings with a stack of letters that says, don't worry, the second he gets out of jail, we'll have him whacked. So he just stays there. So your communications with him, are they small got, talk? I mean, are they uh, he writes, deep? He, he writes poetry, and a, more, more or less religious poetry, uh, Christian religious poetry. And then he checks, like, he heard somehow that I, I just recovered from cancer twice. And he heard about that, and he's very concerned about my health. And and I even thought at one point, you know, I'd try to be, do something nice for him and maybe get a few people to sign something. Say, you know, we're big Beatles fans, but we forgive you. You know, you've, you want to be forgiven, and that's part of the foundation of the faith. And he said, don't you dare. Uh, you know, somebody will come after your family members or you and I. We'll be right back. It's Banner and Company, and we're back with today's guest, Richard Courtney. So, Richard, your life changed a lot in a hurry. I know you were diagnosed with cancer for the first time, and I remember us talking about it when you were listing my neighbor's house for sale. You showed no symptoms, had no reason to believe anything was going on, but you found a specialized doctor who questioned everything. Tell me more about that. Well, uh, my, uh, I have uh, twins that are at Ensworth, and one of them is a friend of a person named, well, both of them are friends with this person named Christian Kurtz, and he's playing on my son's basketball team, and I was talking to his mother, and she said, I'm getting into something called concierge medicine. I never heard of it. And I said, exactly what is that? And she said, well, it's a thing where I, I would be the central uh, physician and I would monitor all of the other things. And, and being 
back then, 66 years old or whatever it was, you know, it's nice to have, I had a urologist and I had a cardiologist and I had this and that. And she, so she said, I'll just send you everywhere. I'll get the results and we'll, and I'll make sure. Cause I had heard about the left hand, not knowing what the right hand's doing and, and somebody getting on two drugs that aren't copacetic. And so I thought, why not? So I did it and, uh, she had, uh, everything back and everyone said I was fine. And so she said, I said, well, that's great. She said, I don't think you are. And I said, well, if everybody else thinks I am, I must be. And I felt great. And she said, uh, well, let me do some things. And then she sent the blood around, and people kept saying, I'm okay. She sent me a hematologist and oncologist, and they all said, let's check back in a year. She checked with my previous uh, primary care physician, and, and she, he said, his bone, he has a lazy, lazy bone marrow, and it's, that's why the platelet count. It's been consistent for all these years. And so she said, I, I still don't like it. So she actually drew blood herself and looked at it and said, oh, I think you have something called MGUS, which is a, a monoclonal gammopathy of an undetermined significance. What a silly title. And uh, so, you know, everybody goes to Dr. Google and so MGUS. And, and a third of the people uh, who get MGUS get something called myeloma, and there can be a smoldering myeloma, or there can be a multiple myeloma, and you want to get smoldering. Uh, it's easily curable. Multiple means it's starting to affect an, an, uh, an organ. So she said, I'm pretty sure. So they did a bone marrow biopsy, and I had a multiple myeloma, which is a cancer of the blood. And it's a strange cancer because it forms lesions on the bones. And uh, we know a person who, who didn't know they had it. It's hard to detect, apparently. And, uh, and they raised their arms at the airport to be, uh, see if they had metal in them, and their arms both broke. And they didn't know it. And I have a friend in Columbia who got in and out of his boat a bunch of times that one day, and then the last time he jumped, his whole leg shattered. And then uh, there's a person on the, that played basketball a long time ago at UT, but she was like 6'1 when she was there, and she's down to 5'8 before they found it. So they hardly, it's hard to detect. And, uh, and luckily, I went to this concierge doctor who's a mother of a friend of a son who just wouldn't take no. I, I actually, and I've said this to her, so I thought she was just trying to prove the 4500 bucks a year it charges, you know, to be, uh, have a concierge doctor. But she uh, certainly saved a number of bones and probably my life because with me, it had gotten into my kidney. And uh, so I had three months, 90 days of chemo. And then I got COVID of all darn things. And that's when I really got sick because I didn't have an immune system. So I had to go to ICU at Vanderbilt for about a week. So then when I got over COVID, they had to do three more months of chemo because they didn't know if the other three months had taken. And then they did a stem cell transplant and they harvested, uh, or at least they collected nine million stem cells. And then they put five million back in me and cured it. So uh, cancer free and off I go for a year. <laughs> and then I said, my nose really hurts. And she said, well, let's send you to the, this person, that person. They said, hey, it, it doesn't look like cancer, but I'm going to cut your septum, remove it. So they started on my septum. They said, it didn't look like cancer, but I took quite a bit more and, and sent it to the lab. And then I had cancer in the nose. And so then they said, uh, we could treat it probably with radiation and chemotherapy, but if it doesn't work, your nose and your skin will be compromised, and we can't do what we really need to do, which is amputate your nose. And I said, amputate my nose? That's barbaric. You can't be serious. And they said, no, that way, you know, just take your nose off, and, you know, then we'll get some cadavers, and we'll put some cartilage and bones back in there, and then we'll – they put a um, – skin expander between my skull and my forehead and shot 10 cc's of fluid in there every other day for a month and this thing by the end was it looked like I had a baseball stuck on the top of my forehead and then they cut that off and dropped it over my nose and used that skin to make a nose so right now the nose you see is was my forehead 90, 60 days ago it was right there so at first if I touched it there it hurt if I touched it on my nose it felt like a I was on, I touching my forehead. Was that a sort of phantom pain that people... Uh, what's the nerves moved? It ah. moved from there. The, the, ner the, the same nerves are in there. And then they had to take, I know I can see this, but it doesn't matter, but they had to take a vein and an artery out of my arm and run the artery from here to there 
tunnel it, and then they took the vein and ran it from there to there. And, uh, and now I have a nose that's about twice the size of my normal nose, and they'll go back and sculpt that in two or three months, and then I'll have a normal. Well, I can have about any nose I want. Yours is looking pretty good. I might, okay. I might just go with your nose. <laughs> you, you go through the book and say. <laughs> yeah. Everybody thinks I should do Pitt, Brad Pitt, but I don't think his nose, I mean, he's a beautiful man, but I don't think there's a strong <laughs> suit. <laughs> your nose hurt. But, uh, yeah, just okay. to the touch. To the touch, yeah. If I the skin, like a, if I pick up a pillow and put it on my nose, I could feel a pain in the very point of my nose. And then there was uh, what they called a lesion back on the septum that just felt like. It. And then I had had a wart in my nose, like when I was twelve, and they said it never goes away; it's just grown back. And so that's when they decided to remove it, and that's when they found the cancer. Really, all you know, I sell real estate, and I've been able to keep a focus on that and just kind of forget about the other. And when, the funny thing is, when I was really maimed, uh, I had two people wanted to list houses, and I thought I don't want to lose these. And I said, Well, here's the thing: I don't. At that point, didn't have a nose, and uh, I, you know, I have this situation. And as it turns out, both of them were physicians. They said, Well. Take a look. And so <laughs> they said, I wonder how you do this rhinectomy thing. So so a lot of the houses that I listed during the last 180 days were uh, people who were curious about, about this particular procedure. I saw on Facebook a bunch of your friends and neighbors serenading you. Was that during the worst part of all this? Yeah, that was really, that was really touching. Uh, a friend of ours, Richard Bryan, I texted people throughout their time to tell me, tell them how I was doing or what was going on here. And he was on several different texts. So he found everybody that was on all those texts and people he knew I knew. And he rounded up about 150 of them. And they, and they sang, uh, I want to hold your hand. All you need is love. And here comes the sun in our, in our front yard. Serenaded me. So it was beautiful. Quite a day. That's so Nashville. Yeah. Isn't it? It is. It was great. I mean, I'm sure Simon's it would happen in other places, but I like to think that Healing someone with music is so Nashville. That's probably right. Company is a production of the new Nashville Banner. Our producers are Steve Harouche and Andrea Tudhope. The original music is by Verlin Thompson. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts or go to NashvilleBanner.com. You're in good company. Mm-hmm.